Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, your ticket to all things college football. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? Join us as we talk college football from the national championship to college rivalries to bowl games to the Heisman Trophy to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. What is up? Welcome into the GSMC Football Podcast. It is a Wednesday, and I am Tom Doherty, which makes this the college football edition of the GSMC Football Podcast, as we are 100 days away from the kickoff of college football, and we are going to talk way too early about this all this stuff obviously especially about week one if you look at my, my title thing you look, week, week one of what nfl week one of college well the nfl week one well of course it matters you want to get out to a good start it's not going to make or break your, your season likely for most teams however in college football every week matters and yes week one can make and break your season <laughs> especially if you lose when you should win uh but so we're going to go over some matchups from week one coming up this uh, this year, and talking about ones that um, need to need to uh, that are that are going to be spicy games, going to be games that are, can uh, set some teams back and push some teams forward, can get some teams into the conversation that were not in the conversation to begin with when it comes to the college football playoff, and then also we're going to look at some of the most dominant schools and what makes them so dominant. Um, as well. So we're going to jump right into it. And of course, uh, as always, this podcast is brought to you by the GSMC podcast network as we will jump right in. Uh, the, um, the the biggest matchup, I think, is Washington and Auburn week one. It, it has the most implications. It's got a school that sh- was in the college football playoff two years ago. It has a school that was thinking they should have made it to the college football playoff last year. After beating Alabama, and then losing, of course, in the SEC championship game. And, I mean, and the thing is, many deemed that to be. I mean, imagine if Auburn had won the SEC championship game, they would have got in because they would have had to be, and then it would have been the decision to put Georgia or Alabama in. That would have been a quite the pickle for the CS, uh, uh, CFP committee, right there. Fortunately for them, they didn't have to make the decision. This this through uh they got the Georgia, they got Georgia in there uh, with the win against Auburn and obviously then you know we're just going to throw Alabama in there the other two the other two college uh, conference cha- camp champions can go skedaddle actually the other three didn't only two conference champions make it last year Clemson and uh Clemson yeah right Clemson and um no Oklahoma okay so the other two yeah Oklahoma Clemson and Georgia all won their conference the other two uh the Pac-12 winner which I think was USC, I don't know, maybe it was Stanford, and uh, the Big Ten winner, Ohio State, did not make it last year. So, interesting, but definitely the most the most uh, implications coming into the season is Washington and Auburn. That matchup is going to be a big one. Jake Browning looking to bounce back off for, after being in the conversation two years ago for the Heisman. Got b- bounced around a little bit, uh, beat up a little bit in that game against Alabama. Had a bum shoulder pretty much uh, all of last season. Couldn't really get the ball down the field, drive it down the field. And uh, he'll be back this year. Um, and uh, I even have it on first account that he is uh, feeling just just fine, is much better than last year, and uh, can um, and is, is definitely up to – I mean, he's definitely up to it, but definitely able to get back to where he was uh, his sophomore year and get his team back to the – Conversation, at least when it comes to the college football playoff, but definitely a game that is uh, has a lot of implications. Uh, that's the Auburn and uh, um, and Washington game, and that game 
uh, whether it's going to be in Auburn. I think it's going to be in. Uh, yeah, they don't tell me where it is. I can find out where it is really quick. But uh, that that game really matters. Obviously, the fact. I mean, when it comes to uh, these conferences, these are both two teams. They don't really get the most hype in their conference. Obviously, in the in the Pac-12, it's your USC and your Stanford and your Oregon. And uh, your Cal, I mean, not Cal, but not very good. But even UCLA gets conversation. And Washington kind of gets lost by the wayside a little bit, even though they, they have been the best team in that conference for the last few years. Uh, Auburn, the same thing. They obviously get the SEC has a lot of different, uh, a lot of different schools that can overshadow them. Whether it's Alabama, Florida, uh, LSU, who Florida and LSU haven't even been that very good. Auburn's been good. Uh, the biggest question for Auburn is though they have to replace both their running backs and um, they have to figure that out how they're going to figure that out. Obviously I think that would be just fine. We're going to get, we're going to find the next wave of guys. And that's what, that's the job of these college uh, recruiters and coaches that they're going to go find the next wave of guys. And they uh, likely will do that down there in Auburn. But um, as far as the uh, uh, FPI stuff, you know, the, the index that trains the uh, probability, it says if Washington, uh, does get the victory against Auburn, they'll have a 50%, 51% chance of having a, um, the, uh, you know, their playoff proxy, the SOR is, uh, how they have basically, you know, they, they can't cause it's not math. It's not math. Like it used to be before you can make literally a, a math equation and try and predict, uh, with wins. If you input wins, you can predict if a team's going to be put up in the top rankings. Now it's all committee. And, uh, so they say 51% of trying to make it is making it in the top four, of that uh, CFP rankings, if they do win the game, if uh, Auburn wins, uh, they'll have thirty-five percent chance of making it. Uh, so I'm mean, looking at the rest of their schedule as well. Um, I did want to. I mean, th- there's a bunch of games here, so I kind of wanted to split these off in uh, into different segments. As I do want to go uh, into one other. Yeah. So the first two segments we're going to do. Um, these first two games. Next one is Michigan and uh, Notre Dame. Obviously, it is probably the best game uh, as we're going to get the season started with a bruiser of a game there. And uh, it's just definitely, I mean, both these teams, I wouldn't say Michigan's a legitimate playoff contender. Obviously, they get Shea Patterson from Ole Miss, which is now I've even heard that he could be a first-round draft pick next year in the NFL. And uh, this is the first time that Jim Harbaugh is going to get a real pro style quarterback this is the first time he's going to actually be able to groom one this is the first time i think that he can hopefully keep one healthy because that's been the problem uh not only have they been getting he's been getting uh lackluster performances from his quarterbacks uh due to some lower skill level limited skill levels they've been getting hurt so i mean he needs to be able to keep a quarterback healthy and um with the projections um notre dame uh does have the fifth best chance according to the ESPN FBI projections to finish um, at top four of the uh, that was SOR. Uh, so that means like, you know, get into the college world playoff as, as far as their predictions. Um, when it comes to the metric, they have metrics for everything. They have a quality metric, which is kind of crazy. I mean, they have game quality metrics, uh, basically like who, how good is this matchup? Obviously they say that Auburn Wisconsin, well, Washington game is the best one matchup wise with uh, this, um, with that game against uh, against against the Michigan, but um, you know, I mean, I mean, with the game against Michigan and Notre Dame, I think that's that's a close second. I mean, for some people, if you're out in the West, Coast, if you're out in the Midwest, you probably think this one's the best matchup because it's just the rivalry and uh, the uh, proximity of the two schools to each other, and the fact that they're just um, they're really going to get after it. It's going to be September first, obviously. It'll be the first look at Jay Patterson, a quarterback who I think. With, I mean, if you look at uh, if you look at Jim Harbaugh's career, I mean, the fact that he was at Stanford had J- Andrew Luck, um, obviously with Pep Hamilton and everything there next to him, that really helps with Andrew Luck. I think that's the one thing that Jim Harbaugh was lacking at Michigan is a is a solid his his staff never really got uh never really got figured out the way he wanted it to, because, I mean, you saw what he had at San Francisco. You had Vic Fangio as the defensive coordinator. You had Greg Roman as your offensive coordinator. Two very 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 good coordinators. That are pretty much basically going to run their their plays. Jim was kind of the facilitator there in SF, and also was the face of the uh, coaching staff and almost like face, seemingly the face of the franchise at certain points, uh, as he was just as popular as the players were. Jim was, um, but with, with like well, just like in in Stanford, I mean, you had David Shaw, you got Pep Hamilton right there next to you. I think Michigan he needs to get a little bigger names. 
uh, in there with him, next to him on that sideline, to get some more support. I know this year the he they the Michigan there they last year I think they went to the Vatican. Michigan did. Now they're going to Africa. They're going on safari. We'll see how that prepares them for this game against Notre Dame, and we'll see how Shea. I mean, Shea Patterson. Fortunately for them, that he's he's going to play. Um, that definitely helps them out there. The, being able to protect him is going to be the biggest deal. Um, as far as when it comes to Notre Dame, they could uh, definitely um, surprise people with uh, with their way they get through the season. They got a good aerial attack. Their offense. They got Brandon Wimbush back there with another year of quarterback. I mean, these college quarterbacks. I think every year, every year they they have to uh, adjust so quickly to new guys coming in to changes to the roster. I mean, injuries, all stuff. I mean, NFL quarterbacks come in, they go to work, they come out. I mean, they're kind of used to it. But at college, you're only there for so long, three, maybe four years, maybe. Uh, and you got to you got to do well in a short period of time. So you have to basically overwork yourself into a point where you know you're going to be ultra prepared for this. And because uh, it's basically your tryout. I mean, your whole college career, if you want to be an NFL, especially if you want to be a quarterback like Brandon Wimbush or Shea Patterson, it's your tryout for a whole – you get a three-year tryout basically. And uh, we're going to we'll evaluate you off of that. And then you'll get more, you'll get a couple of mini tryouts, but really, I mean, the, I know the draft, I mean, I know that the draft is kind of a weird thing. We just had the draft with the whole, uh, stuff with the combine and your pro days, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we all love watching these guys work out in shorts. Uh, but I mean, seeing them play on the field, actually getting good tape of them from college, that's your whole tryout. And then starting in this game, Michigan, Notre Dame is going to be a big tryout starting off. Um, I know Michigan's defense obviously also will, um, be, uh, be a big be a big uh, test for them. Uh, Notre Dame's defense also coming in looking pretty good. As far as Notre Dame's schedule, I just want to peek at that really quick. It is saying I'm looking at here with this at uh, their uh, FPI as I'm seeing uh, the schedule rankings. Uh, the schedule rating is pretty high for um, Fighting Irish. Obviously, they do have a uh, don't really have that big aerial attack. Brandon Wimbush more of that kind of short pass running running quarterback. But the defense and their the defense and their schedule could help them uh, get more bang for your buck if they can get string some wins together. Uh, their strength of schedule could definitely be a, a help for them if they can get some wins because the um, the fact I mean you got to play they're going to play four three schools this year from big I mean at least three schools from big uh, from big conferences that are pro are perennial winners. I mean they play Michigan obviously to start off the season. Then uh, they have to obviously they're going to host Stanford on uh, September 29th and then they go to uh, Notre Dame. They go to SC to finish off. So yeah, that's basically what they do every year. Here they're going to have that's why they can I mean I think I've said it before on the show that Notre Dame does get some good Cal- California recruits because they can um go and tell these families that, hey, we're going to be here over the holiday time. So the last, like last game of the season, Thanksgiving time, we're going to be here playing either in uh, in Palo Alto or down in Los Angeles because we're going to play USC or Stanford. That's how it kind of rotates. So Stanford will be traveling to Notre Dame and uh, then... USC will be coming, uh, will be, Notre Dame will be going to USC. They also play Florida State at home. Uh, they got a tough home, ga- a tough road game against uh, Virginia Tech. They play Navy on the, ro- uh, they play Northwestern on the road. And uh, they also play Navy on the road as well. So, uh, yeah, it is a pretty tough schedule. I mean, they, they kind of get part of that SEC, uh, ACC schedule, even though they're the independent. They, I think they made a deal with the ACC to get a couple games in on there. So they play Florida State, Syracuse. Uh, Pitt is in the ACC. Virginia Tech is in the ACC. So, um, yeah, and they play also a couple of SEC, Vanderbilt, Wake Forest. So, um, yeah, Notre Dame, their, their schedule, well, this is going to be the biggest make or break, I think. When they get past Michigan, it's going to be a big deal for them. Michigan gets, gets past them. It's going to be basically whoever wins that game is going to get an ultra boost, basically. Um, and same thing for the game, the first game, Washington and uh, Auburn. I mean, the thing is, if you if, even like we saw it last year, obviously, Ohio State lost to uh, uh, Oklahoma. Did that cost them? Uh, they lost to Oklahoma early in the season at home. If they lost, uh, if you lose on the road, I think it's. A, I mean, obviously, if you lose on the road, if, if Oklahoma had lost that game, they may have gotten still in the college football playoff because Oklahoma didn't they lose to? They lost to Iowa State last year, right? And uh, they still made it in the college football playoff. That game was on the road, so um, I mean, the road losses are definitely a little uh, less less of a hit than the home losses. So like if say Washington was to lose this game um, or if um, Michigan was to lose this game, probably wouldn't hurt them as much 
as it would be if a home team was to lose. All right. So we'll come back with the next uh, couple games I want to talk about regarding these uh, this opening week, and then we'll get into uh, some stuff on uh, how dominant these uh, these programs really are. So we'll do that when we come back. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to SMC Football Podcast, the College Football Edition. As we are going to go over some more game, some more stuff, some more matchups, some more everything. As that music just ends right there. Um, next one. I mean, uh, is it most? To, I mean, it says most to gain. I, I mean, are we ever doing this most to gain? I mean, these, this is the F- FPI. I'm looking at these FPI things. I mean, according to it, it says uh, Alabama against Louisville. I mean, they should beat that. I mean, obviously, if Louisville wins, then yes, that's the most to gain for them. They beat Alabama, duh. But, uh, but um, obviously, this is the game on Sunday. I think yeah. So it's the game after that game. The LS, there's the LSU. Or maybe that's the game. I don't know. There's there's a game Saturday and Sunday. I can never. I always get mixed up with the but which one is which day. I, I've gone over it. Look, listen to the show last week as well. So, um, but yeah, I mean, so uh, but the fact that the Cardinals don't have Lamar Jackson, um, obviously, according to the uh, index, that they do have a 13 percent chance of beating Alabama. Uh, it'll be um, likely, I think, at least. To go uh, to a tug of Iloa, his first start of the of the year, um, because or first start uh, uh, for him in, in a in his career, obviously at at Alabama, because I think he really won that job last January with uh, the win over Georgia. But for Alabama, it's all going to come down to just physicality. I think they just can they can out. Be out, out physical, uh, physical people. That's good English. It's not. Uh, their physicality is just gonna. They're gonna out pound and ground and mound and everything with an ound on it uh, for <laughs> for the whole game against that team. I mean, against Louisville, which I think is just this, a bad matchup. Honestly, Louisville doesn't. They seem like more of a kind of a scrappy, fast team on the outside. Going to use a lot of uh, trying their trying to use their speed and athleticism. When you just have Alabama, it's just gonna absolutely maul you all day long. Um, I mean, we'll see who they're gonna, who their heir apparent is to Bo Scarborough, who's gone. But with Tua, I think that it might change up their offense a little bit. They might, I mean, as much as they're gonna ground and pound you with Tua, they can, uh, they can air it out for sure, uh, because he definitely has the ability to uh, get the ball down the field. Um, I mean, with, with Alabama, I don't think that I'm really worried about this game. Obviously, it is a neutral field. Um, in fact, that with with this uh, with this win, it could boost uh, it could boost them. And uh, with the fact that their their chances from forty to forty percent to uh, yeah. So I mean, this is the I mean, if Michigan. The thing is, that's the thing. It's all about the gain. So if their their percent, they have their uh, percent chance for that ROI. That uh, what are that what was that other metric? The SOR one, where it's basically like you know they're basically guessing to say that they're going to be good enough to get picked and put into the committee will put them in the final. Uh, I mean, Michigan gets the best bo- boost if they get a win. But if Alabama uh, wins, obviously, uh, it'll just pad their pad, start, start a season off right and pad the resume. I think if, if, if they lose, it's obviously still Alabama, and they could reel off 10 wins in a row with the SEC championship game and uh, be just fine. 
But uh, I think that if they do win, they'll this will be a start to another uh, excellent uh, season. I mean, the thing is, Alabama's only gone undefeated one time on their way to a championship. They've only gone uh, one time, just once. So uh, I think th- there's definitely uh, a chance here. Uh, when it comes to when it comes to the other way around, if Georgia Georgia's first game is against Austin P. So uh, yeah, they should win that game. If they do lose, they're pretty much that's that's kind of a a, a death death shot right there at the beginning of the season. That would be kind of a obviously it would be a major upset, uh, and it'd be kind of one of like one of those ones you see at the beginning of a NCAA tournament for basketball. We're just gonna kill them right there, basically just just knock down, drag out, boom, done. Uh, the season's over, and uh, if obviously if they do lose, uh, they, that drop that they would drop them to a ten percent chance of getting uh, into the conversation for. I mean, I'm calling it the conversation because it's not saying they're going to get in or not. It's uh, getting them in the realm of where they're going to think that the chances are good for them to get picked by this committee. So uh, there's definitely when. It, um, when it comes to this, uh, it's going to be a big deal. Uh, there's, there's another team uh, that, they, that this FPI has on everything. We got to we got to include um, we got to include UCF. Can't forget them. They're going to play Connecticut to start of the season, and that's going to be a big one. As uh, they uh, that's for their conference title at least, as they look to uh, back up their 13 or no season with another good good season as well. Uh, I do want to note. I think I talked about it last week a little bit. Uh, the LSU football schedule. Um, Looking at their first game of the season this year, they are yeah. So they're going to play in Miami. That's the that's the game on Sunday. The the Atlanta the um, Alabama and uh, Louisville game is on Saturday. Miami and LSU. That's going to be a big game. I think I don't know why that's not listed here with the these big FPI games, but um, that's going to be a game that's going to implement a lot of stuff for I think Miami. It's, it's basically. The pressure's on Miami, I think, because LSU, they're playing with house money right now. Nobody, their ex- the expectations are low. Um, I mean, usually they are high. But we've had so many years of LSU just being kind of middle of the road. Um, we're not really looking at it that way anymore because of the fact that uh, they are just kind of, they're kind of just done, obviously. I mean, they're kind of, they've been done down in the bottom of the SEC for quite, uh, quite some time now. Uh, obviously, you at Orgeron is going to try and turn that around, but I don't know. I think Miami is definitely more on the up and up. And uh, with the comes to just pressure, I'm just talking about pressure. I'm not saying that Miami's going to win or anything. I'm not making predictions quite yet. But as far as pressure goes, Miami definitely has the most pressure on them uh, having to travel to Texas to play that game against LSU. And if LSU can steal that away from them, Miami is going to be like, uh, it's kind of like a false start to their season because. Now you're zero one. Boom! To start the season, you got to reel off a bunch of wins, and they the ACC, the ACC is no no uh, slide. It's a it's a tough sled. So um, there's definitely some things to um, to get in there because it's <laughs> it's no easy it's no easy one through the ACC these these days anymore. It used to be, uh, but not anymore. As Miami, they everybody thought last year they were a year ahead of where they should have been. Uh, we'll see if now this is supposed to be the year where they were pop, supposed to pop. Uh, Mark Rick to his second season, getting some more of his recruits in there, some more of his guys as uh, they will will uh, try to to get Malik Rozier into the position where he can start and becoming a leader. Obviously, you'd want him to uh, want him to start thinking uh, about that as well. So um, when it comes to the first games, this is all it's all coming to fruition now. As we're looking at these uh, these FPI kind of you know what's the outcome what 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 does the outcome mean what is everything uh, how does everything shake out I think that they're forgetting the LSU Miami game because if uh, Miami's FPI that so SOR kind of thing uh, is up there I say probably about around like thirty percent right now thirty forty percent they lost to LSU would drop because they play in a tough they play in a tough conference they have uh, it'd be tough to get into the F, uh, to get two ACC teams so I think Clemson is pretty much um, they're due unless they have an absolute, just crazy bad season or something like that. And um, I mean, the other thing is, if they Kelly Bryant can't play, Trevor Lawrence can come in there, and he probably can. He's I'm, I'm not saying he can play, and I'm not because we haven't seen him yet. Uh, Kelly Bryant, we actually have seen, but I would say that Kelly, Trevor Lawrence probably can play just fine. 
and uh, can maybe pull that Clemson team back up if they do st- falter at the beginning of the season with Kelly Bryant. Um, still no decision yet if Kelly Bryant is actually going to be the starter of that team come the first game. Trevor Lawrence could very easily become that first team. Um, as far as as far as uh, the go- it goes with the with the rest of the SEC or the rest of the ACC, basically Clemson and Miami are the ones looking up and up right now. Uh, Clemson's first game this year. I don't know. If, I don't think they play one of those big games. They did last year. Um, they don't have one of those big non-conference games this year. I don't think. Well, starting off the season, unless I'm wrong, as we uh, pull up the schedule, the old schedule here on uh, and trying to figure out. I mean, Clemson. That's the thing. They can get their quarterback situation started, figured out. They start. You know, they don't. They play. They're actually well. They do. They do it week two. They play Texas A&M. They play Texas A&M week two, and that should be a good, um, good matchup there. So that'll be fun to see him, them go up against uh, uh, Jimbo Fisher there in his first year at at, at Texas A&M. Dabo going in uh, that game's going to be at Texas A&M. So that'll be a cool test to see. I mean, Kelly Bryant. I think he'll get the start, but uh, it's definitely going to um, going to be a question mark going in. All right. That's, uh, I mean, I've kind of talked to ad nauseum about these uh, first games a little bit. We're not quite to the end of the third, second segment here as we're going to overlap a little bit here. We're gonna, The third segment, I want to go over uh, a couple different things to watch as we are now, like I said, 100 days away from the first game of um, of, of this uh, great season coming up. Obviously, the coaching carousel was in full effect coming in, uh, going into the offseason. Jimbo Fisher is now in Texas A&M. Uh, Sw- uh, Sag- Swaggart's now down from Oregon. Now he's down in uh, Florida State. Mario Cristobal takes over at Oregon. Um, we got uh, Ch- Chip Kelly's at, L- at UCLA. Uh, who else we got? Kevin Sumlin hasn't found a job yet, but we have, oh yeah, Herm Edwards, the uh, ESPN uh, and NFL coach, uh, is now the head coach of the Arizona Sun Devils. Um, and uh, Dan Mullen is the head coach at Florida. Uh, Joe Moorhead takes over at Michigan State. And obviously, um, I mean, that's pretty much it, I think, for running big, big-time big schools, right? And nobody else really moved around uh, in the uh, Big Ten. Big Ten has a bunch of – Big Ten has a bunch of guys who I think are going to be there for a while. James Franklin ain't leaving. Uh, <laughs> Jim Harbaugh, I think the AD came out and says that he, they want him to retire – as the coach in Michigan, so he's not going anywhere anytime soon unless he decides to go back to the NFL or something. And then uh, Paul Christ at, Mo- at Wisconsin, he's probably just fine sitting there uh, w- coaching that team. And then, I'll, oh, yeah, duh, Scott Frost comes over. He's a new coach there at Nebraska. Duh, 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 duh. Just figure it out. Uh, duh. And then, obviously, we have some two second-year coaches uh, with um, Mark Richt at Miami and uh, Kirby Smart at Georgia. All right. Well, regarding this, uh, hundred things to watch. Obviously, number one, I think for me, is we go stepping away all from this uh, CFP stuff. I know we just went all through those coaches, and one of the coaches I know mentioned was Scott Frost, and was Nebraska, and was the fact. Um, and I always think about when I think about Nebraska, I think about the fact that they are in the uh, uh, Big Ten West. And they play in that much weaker Big Ten West. Obviously, they just re I mean, they re realigned those divisions like three years ago, I think. And they decided, oh, let's just put Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan State, and Michigan all in the same one. And only one of those teams can make it to the make it to the uh, <laughs> to the conference championship game. I think that might. I think this is going to change pretty soon. But once they get start start getting Iowa and Wisconsin and Nebraska in the Big Ten championship game every year. Uh, instead of a Michigan State or a Michigan, uh, I mean, I mean, usually Ohio State does find their way in there, but winning that Western, uh, the Eastern Division. But I think they just kind of they're going to have to figure that one out. So actually, we're, I'm, I don't want to have to stop in, in between my takes on um, Nebraska. So um, I'm going to cut it right there. We'll come back with the second, third segment of the day. We're going to go through all these a couple different things to look out for as we are now 100 days away from the start of college football. We'll be back in just a moment.
Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to GSMC Football Podcast as we are back here now with the third segment of the day going through some things to watch as we, uh, I know they came out a hundred, ESPN did their hundred things to watch with a hundred days to go. I don't do, I'll, I'll do 10 things to watch maybe because I don't have time for a hundred things unless I just rapid fire in this last, this last two segments. But um, I definitely want to talk about Nebraska and Scott Frost and the fact that uh, their schedule is not going to be <laughs> it's just this Big Ten scheduling. Whoever does that does not like the, I don't know if it's, it's randomly generated. They must just really like Iowa. They must really like uh, they must really like Wisconsin. Every time I look at these schedules, I'm like, why? They're so unbalanced. This is just ridiculous. Basically, if you have a lot of t- you, if basically, I think they probably rotate which teams they play from the other division. If you're in the East or the West, you play obviously you play other teams from the other division, but uh, you, you don't play all of them. And Nebraska is playing like the worst ones, uh, so I just want to put Iowa schedule side by side with the Alabama schedule. I tell you to go do that yourself uh, because it's pretty striking. So I mean Iowa, their road games are at Minnesota and at Indiana. Um, and at Illinois and at Purdue, that's it. Their toughest home game is against Wisconsin. Uh, they also have Nebraska and Northwestern. They don't play any Michigan team. They don't play Ohio state. They don't play Penn state. So if there's a team that I would put my money on to go, I mean, undefeated, maybe if they can get past Wisconsin, but definitely to get up in the top, maybe win that conference, win that division, and that part of the conference, it'd be Iowa compared to Nebraska in Scott Frost's first first go at it here uh, with a big big conference school. Obviously, seeing what he did at UCF definitely makes me think he could do it, uh, do the same thing at a bigger school. And UCF has some great players as well. But look at Nebraska's schedule. Um, yeah, their schedule isn't that basically. It's uh, it's quite more. It's quite difficult. Um, as I mean, they have. I think they got Ohio State on the road. I know they obviously have to go to. They play oh, Iowa on the road. That's one of the games I can tell here on this one. But uh, they play a non-conference game against Colorado, who's no slouch uh, at home. They have to go to Michigan. They have to go to Wisconsin, and they have to go to Ohio State, and they have to go to Iowa. They play Michigan State at home, so they they play both Michigan schools and Ohio State, and Iowa doesn't play anybody. <laughs> Oh, Iowa. Okay, yeah. The, okay, I did misread their schedule. They have to go to Penn State. Okay. Iowa has to go to Penn State. Michigan, Nebraska doesn't play Penn State. They just play both Michigan schools and Ohio State. Uh, two of the three are on the road. They play Michigan State at home. The other two are on the road. Uh, that Nebraska-Michigan game on December on September 22nd will be a fun one uh, there at the big house. But it's just, who makes a schedule? Scott Frost has got to be like, what the bleep is going on here uh, with these schedules? I mean, this is my first year. You can't get me. I'll take that Ohio Iowa schedule. If you're Scott Frost, I'll take that Iowa schedule. Thank you very much. I'll play my road games at Maryland. I'm sorry, at Miss, um, Minnesota, at Iowa, uh, Iowa, or I mean, at Illinois and at um, Indiana. Thank you. I'll take that. They play Maryland at home. Woo. And... Um, they play Northern Illinois and Northern Iowa and Iowa State all at home. 
in their non-conference games. They don't play a. They'll, let's think about Iowa. They don't schedule a big. They they get told that the, those three first three games. They're like, oh, we're playing. We're gonna do our interstate uh, rivalry for our uh, uh, interconference game. You know, the we play a different conference. We, we're gonna play Iowa State every year. Basically, that's our that's our interconference game. We're going to go play the Big Twelve and play Iowa State every year to get that in, in interstate rivalry. Um, yeah, um, yeah. The big whoever makes that Big Ten schedule needs to give it to Iowa next year. Um, I think last the one year they did get it. I think I think this past season they actually got a tough schedule. They had to play a bunch of teams. Um, we look at look at from last year how they fared last year. Obviously. Um, was not not quite what they wanted clearly um but looking at it compared when they get matched up against the tough teams oh look at they had to play michigan state on the road they lost they had to play uh who else they play they played wisconsin at home lost that one too barely beat minnesota they played northwestern at home lost that one uh, they didn't really play anybody this year. I mean, last year they had to play Michigan. Uh, they actually did beat Michigan at home by one point. That was that low scoring game. But uh, yeah, they didn't play anybody. They, oh, they got absolutely shellacked by Penn State. But Penn State was really good last year, obviously, uh, with Saquon Barkley. But shellacked Iowa State. I mean, uh, there in that game, they got beat by Northwestern. They didn't have to play. They didn't have to play. They didn't play Ohio State last year, and they didn't play Michigan State la- last year as well. They played Penn State and Michigan and uh they lost they actually did beat Michigan so that was that big i guess quote unquote upset whatever whatever you want to call it but Iowa I go on my I can go on my Iowa rant for another 10 minutes this is ridiculous especially looking at their schedule this year compared to the Nebraska schedule this year in Scott Frost's first season obviously um Scott Frost has had a weird little uh, off season with this whole national championship hubbub um, surrounding him and uh, the uh, in Alabama and all that stuff that he's had to deal with has been probably a great distraction or I mean just or not it's just been a, kind of annoying because I mean he's just been puddling along there trying to figure out how to get into uh, get a groove there in Lincoln and he's had to deal with uh, a lot of pushback from from Nick Saban even uh, with this. Uh, with this stuff regarding the, the whole national championship thing, even though it was his his school, I don't know if he was the guy who was really pushing it. I know the AD, the athletic director at UCF, was really pushing it. Uh, he was already one foot out the door while they were doing their bowl game. I don't even think he coached the, during the bowl game, as, uh, so he was already taking the job at Nebraska. But uh, you know, with Nebraska, it's definitely going to be um, a, a thing to see. It's going to be see. It's going to be a thing to see when it comes to see how UCF plays without him. I wouldn't be surprised if UCF c- takes a major step back without that co- without their coach. Uh, they lose Shaquem Griffin. They lose a couple. I think they lost a couple guys in their defense as well. So I think they're going to figure that uh, figure that out coming up to the season. Obviously, um, that'll be fun to watch and see how uh, see how they do at Nebraska with them. Uh, with Scott Frost there as the new head coach. Uh, next, I wanted to go over, obviously, is um, I did talk about Miami a little bit. It's definitely something to watch this season to see how Miami comes back after a tough end of the season last year. Malik Rozier, did talk, I think I talked about him for a while last uh, last episode as well. And the fact that he is supposedly really good under pressure and the, and the pressure he doesn't really doesn't get, uh, get to him. Well, uh, buddy, you played three really pressure-filled games last year and you lost them all. So, uh, yeah, yeah. You were undefeated and looking like you could walk right into the. All you had to do was beat Pitt, and then yeah, even if probably even if you maybe lose to Clemson, uh, they would maybe think that if you beat Pitt, you were at one more. You still had the same record as Alabama. You had th- two losses. You made it easy. You made it too easy. So did Auburn. I mean, Auburn made it too easy for the CFP to put the committee to put Alabama in there. Make at least make them make the decision difficult. I mean, at least TCU made it a little interesting a couple years ago when they got snubbed. Um, but uh, I mean, it's just mm, weird, weird seeing how they say that. But uh, definitely uh, with the whole turnover chain, the defense is going to have to be right back where it was last year. Uh, Malik Rozier has got to take a step forward this year. Um, we'll see if he can get more weapons. I know they have um, also that running back as well, uh, who can uh, who can probably make who's going to make a big difference as well. We'll see. I don't think 
they're quite there yet to up, up unseat Clemson. I don't think they. I still, if they match up against each other again in an ACC championship game, I'm taking Clemson. Their defense is just too good. Malik Rozier is going to have to take a major, major step forward throughout the whole season in order to get to a point where he's going to play uh, well against a uh, Clemson defense. I think they actually do play each other during the season uh, in SEC play uh, this year. So um, let's see. I was just looking at all these schedules. I never can remember. Uh, nope. They play Florida State in, Mag- in Miami. And they play, Florida, they play Florida State in Virginia, all of Virginia schools. I mean, guess, no, they don't play Clemson. They play Duke, Virginia Tech, and Mi- Virginia. So uh, Miami will have to wait and see if they can. Well, I think both those, they're both on the crash course anyways to get to the ACC championship game and uh, face the for the second year in a row. But we'll see if it's the absolute pounding like it was last year. Um, I think it's just – Clemson just is at a certain point where they – I mean, they they were a quarterback away, a uh, different from, from beating Alabama. Uh, I mean, basically they had the same team as the year before – with that, just knows Deshaun Watson and some guys on the defense, but their defense, the fact, the way that Dabo Sweeney recruits that defense is just absolutely in, incredible. Uh, because, um, especially with Christian Wilkins coming, uh, coming back this year and playing with two very, very talented young defensive linemen, uh, the secondary is a little questionable, question mark, but, uh, we'll probably get that figured out. Secondaries are very ebb and flow kind of way. Uh, obviously, another thing to look forward to. Um, I don't know if I'm going to count. Are we, are we even counting? I don't think I'm counting. I think I'm probably at three or something like that. Uh, is Alabama, of course, is Tua going to start? We're going to leave it at that. Is Tua going to start? Uh, number four, Kirby Smart, for sure, is a question to see. Uh, which I talked about Jake Fromm a lot last in, in the last segment. Or I'm not sorry, in the last show. Um, did talk about how he did took a, a fishing uh, fishing hook in his leg. Uh, a big fisherman Jake Fromm is, but I mean, should we just fine? But it's going to be a question to see how he bounces back his, or not bounces back, but bounces back off the loss to Alabama late in that game and uh, can take a step, but jump, work on, I mean, not work on, but just build off the, the freshman year that he had, which was quite impressive. I mean, building off that year would be very good for him uh, coming into the season because uh, probably will lead his team right back where it was because that's just, that's just the talent they have, obviously, without those two running backs. DeAndre Swift is pretty good, though. I think DeAndre Swift can be – I don't know if he's quite – if he's better than Nick Chubb, but I think he can be a guy. He's kind of that, he's kind of a hybrid of both those two guys, Nick Chubb more the bruiser in between the tackles with – I mean, Sonny Michelle being – who could also be between the tackles but more of a speed back, catch the ball in the backfield kind of thing. Uh, DeAndre Swift can be both those guys, I think. Uh, you can kind of do uh, – can have flashes of both of their uh, – talents and make it work um, as, as the uh, number one back there for Jake Fromm this year. And um, they can be a bit, have a good little tandem. Um, number five, J- Jimbo Fisher, definitely something to watch for this season. Uh, to see his first year. I mean, I could say all the coaches, honestly, all the new coaches, Chip Kelly is one of them. Uh, uh, probably Chip Kelly could be number six. Watch Chip Kelly in this season, obviously seeing how he's going to replace Josh Rosen, um, who's already playing really well there in OTAs with the Cardinals. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be a question mark to see how uh, the UCLA football program is going to go under Chip Kelly, just like the Texas A&M program under Jimbo Fisher with his quarterback decision to make there. Uh, number seven is uh, is definitely is Washington uh, there up there. Jake Browning definitely to watch to see if Jake can get back to that Heisman Trophy conversation like he was two years ago uh, with a healthy shoulder. Obviously, Chris Peterson is going to have that offense humming. And uh, having, having to replace uh, Miles Gaskins and a, uh, I'm sorry, having to replace Dante Pettis, but having Miles Gaskins is uh, helpful. But Dante Pettis, a big weapon on the outside for Jake Brown, Jake Browning, he'll have to find a new number one guy, as I'm sure he will just find. He did. I saw him throw to about 15, seemingly ten or fifteen different receivers in his career at uh, Folsom High School. So uh, definitely just fine there. Uh, number eight. Number eight, I think number eight is going to be to see how the Pac-12 in general can actually get back into the conversation when it comes to the uh, CF College Football Playoff because they are just way on the outside looking in. At least Big Ten, the Big Ten has Ohio State. I know they didn't make a, get a team in last year, but they have Ohio State there. They have a Michigan State there. They even have a Penn State there that can make some noise. Who is the team other than Washington, who I think is even a fringe team at best, honestly, just really depends how Jake does. Um, 
who's another team that can really make a, make a run for? I mean, Stanford, maybe KJ Costello with Bryce Love. Their defense usually always is, is buttoned up with David Shaw, but they seem to falter um, throughout the year. I mean, looking at the Stanford schedule, it's no it's no uh, easy. Um, it's no easy sledding there. Obviously, they got to go travel to uh, – they always get, they kind of get caught up. Obviously, last year they got caught up early with a loss – um, early in the season, and they came then lost again at the end, then end of the year to uh, as San Diego State. So uh, they're going to play San Diego State again to start off the season, and then it's going to be boom right right away. USC get it right at them uh, September eighth. So at uh, at Stanford before they play uh, at home against UC Davis, and then they go to Oregon, and then they go to Notre Dame. So it'll be interesting to see how they go those back to back road games. Uh, that Notre Dame game is actually going to be a four thirty game versus the game they played last year was a ten o'clock game. It was early, early game that was a trap game for them as well. I mean, that was the game they lost against San Diego State. Uh, number, did I say number eight? Number nine. Number nine is going to be uh, Ohio State and their quarterback situation. What's going to happen there? Who's going to be a replacement for? Um, who's going to be the replacement for uh, JT Barrett? And then obviously number ten, not obviously, but number ten is is uh, Michigan. <laughs> How is Jim uh, Jim Harbaugh going to take Shea Patterson and groom him into being uh, another another great quarterback um, that he's been able to uh, do that, like just like he did with Andrew Luck? I mean, I would even throw Colin Kaepernick in there because Colin Kaepernick he made Colin Kaepernick what he was, and if he can turn Shea Patterson into a early first round pick next year uh, and take and have him take Michigan to. Uh, to a big bowl game or maybe into the college football playoff, that would be pretty cool. All right. Then I'll wrap it up for this segment. I'll come back with some stuff regarding the top 25 teams and what makes them tick. What's their big uh, strengths? What's their weaknesses? We'll probably look at some more schedules and speculate. Uh, and I'll maybe whine about how scheduling is uneven and how Iowa gets easier schedules than Nebraska when Scott Frost is first season. All right. We'll do that when we come back. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back, GSMC Football Podcast, the College Football Edition, as we are finishing off the day today with the final segment, going into some more talk on college football and what makes these top 25 teams tick. Why are they so dominant? What makes them win so many games? I mean, these win per- the winning percentages, I mean, obviously the margin for error in college football is uh, quite low. Uh, in uh, it, it, it's quite low. Just it's been quite low. You can't. You can lose maybe one game. That's basically it. I mean, you can make the playoffs in the NFL at nine and seven some years and make a run. I mean, it doesn't make you will, but you could. I mean, it's all possible. Um, definitely uh, something that uh, not a college football team. You can't go. You can't go six and four. You might get a bull bid. You can play in the uh, Valero. I mean, I mean, you can play in the uh, Mankey Car Care Bowl. Or the Bell Helicopter Arms Forces Bowl, or whatever, or the Toilet Bowl, or the New Era Cap Bowl, at Yankee Stadium. You can go play in the baseball stadium if you want. <laughs> if you finish six and or seven and th- uh, or make the uh, what, I can't do math. Uh, seven and f- what is it? Seven and five or seven and four? They play twelve games. Yeah. So yeah, you have to win a bunch of games. There's no margin for error, and there's the reason why these teams are so dominant is because they're always really good. They always win games. And uh, they get good gra- they get good recruits. 
I mean, I mean, going through these teams, obviously, uh, with, there's different strengths to everything. Alabama always seems to have a top tier running back. They have, uh, they have had number uh, Heisman Trophy winners. The last two running backs to win the Heisman Trophy have both been from Alabama, with Derrick Henry and uh, Mark Ingram. They had Bro, they had Bo Scarborough. They had. Uh, Najee Harris, who's going to come in. They have a uh, Damien Harris uh, to return. He has, is returning for a senior season. So, I mean, they got guys who, all over the place who can run the football. I mean, even I would say Jalen Hurts. I mean, he's probably going to transfer up. He's going to make him a running back too. Uh, that would be kind of awkward. I mean, the Clemson, they're really known for their offensive line. They're known, I'm sorry, for their defensive line. The defensive line, like I said, I've been talking about it for probably weeks now, how good Clemson's defensive line is and the fact that, that really what, that's really what makes that team go. And, uh, I mean, having Christian Wilkins come back is huge. Having those two big guys with him uh, under his wings is huge. Um, I, I just... I just can't we can't stress it enough. Uh, Dexter Lawrence, Austin Bryan, Cl- Clone Farrell are just those are the guys that I'm talking about as far as those young guys with Christian Wilkins uh, who are going to make that. I mean, that, it's just that's the line. Line play is so big in football at any level. At any level. I mean, I do a fantasy football show. If you guys want to talk NFL fantasy football Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, on this, uh, uh, look it up the same way you listen to the show. It'll be on their GSMC fantasy football podcast, but I talk about the same thing. You can, you can implement offensive line, defensive line play into fantasy football, into every aspect of football possible because it or disrupt disruption and protection is the two things that those things bring. The offensive line is protection, defensive line disruption, obviously. So, I mean, if you're playing, uh, you have a team like Clemson who's just absolute just maulers on the defensive line. Fortunately, though, when you have a team like that with a weak secondary, if you match them up against a team with a good offensive line, that offensive line can shut down the defensive the defensive prowess, the, the pass rush. Then you'll give your te- you'll give your quarterback time, and you could start shredding. And that's how you beat good teams like that. You get a good offensive line. It comes down to the trench play. Uh, if they, but the thing is, if you have a weak link there, they're going to find that weak link. They're going to exploit it, and uh, your quarterback's going to be on his butt a bunch. Probably your running back's not going to get very many yards. They're, you're going to clog the running lanes. Um, I mean, that's the that's why Clemson has uh, been very very good, I and mean, they've had the best defensive line in the country for seemingly the last three or four years. Uh, at Ohio State, uh, they they're known for their uh, they're actually it's, I mean H back kind of wide receiver thing. I mean, obviously on the offensive side, uh, they've been able to score a lot of points. Um, but with the um, with Dwayne Haskins being the new quarterback. Uh, you're going to see some guys on the perimeter that we may not know the quite names of, but they've been there for a while, and uh, they look to um, make make a name for themselves to get into the NFL. Obviously, there's um, they've had seen their seniors, Paris Campbell, Terry McL- uh, McLaurin, uh, Johnny Dixon, Wallaby guys on the outside to help out the young quarterback um, there. I mean, you, there's nothing better than having a, a veteran receiver. They know how to get open. They know how to stay open, and they know how to tell you no, tell you that you're open. I mean, separation is oh, the more separation, the better for a quarterback. And uh, being able to have soft hands and give them a big target to throw to is only is a bonus, obviously, as well. So having three veteran guys that really know whether you're playing against a man to man, getting getting separation against your man, playing against a zone, finding a soft spot in between the linebacker and the safety, or uh, or whatever it is in the zone, how how their scheme is going. Uh, that's only going to help, and veterans are very, very good at that. Uh, at Georgia, uh, their secondary was that has been their strength. Obviously, they have a good uh, their defensive line is not quite the, the the Clemson level defensive line. It is up there, but uh, they they should have the ability to basically shut down uh, any receivers they play. As um, they're going to having to replace some people. I mean, Don J. Baker and. Um, JJ JR Reed uh, are guys that could definitely uh, be names that we'll think we'll be hearing a lot this year as when it comes to uh, prowess in the secondary. There are also a couple guys that they just uh, there are big prospects they recruited. Uh, Amir Speed, great name for a defensive back, and uh, William Poole uh, should make those guys uh, feel pretty good because um, there's definitely a lot of talent uh, at Oklahoma. Uh, it looks like it's going to, I mean, obviously there have been a lot of quarterback play there. We've had uh, Baker Mayfield, um, 
but they've been making their money off of running backs for a long time. Obviously, uh, they've had Samaji P. Ryan having, uh, I mean, you can go back as far as Adrian Peterson as well. Um, this year, it uh, looks like, I mean, uh, they had Rodney Anderson leading the uh, country in yards from scrimmage. I mean, uh, they, we have, he ran for, I mean, 200 yards in the Rose Bowl. Uh, so, I mean, a guy who's going to come back and uh, with vengeance, so he, oh, not, uh, yeah, with vengeance this year after the loss last year in the Rose Bowl, after running for, I mean, you run for 200 yards in a game and you lose, you're going to be like, oh, what the heck happened? We got to come back and, and, and show some uh, show, show off our talents. Uh, at Washington, even though we ha- they have a, a top-tier quarterback in Jake Browning, um, uh, their secondary is actually a thing to talk about as be it's been able to keep them in, in games a lot because even when Jake last year was having tough uh, tough stretches the defense and especially that secondary was were uh, were big 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 uh, bright spots for the Huskies there obviously having Vita Veja on the defensive line last year too as well helps uh, he's gone and they'll have to replace him to figure out the defensive line but the secondary is going to be a good uh, little backdrop uh, for them. As uh, they have a, a big guys, um, Keith Taylor, uh, Taylor Rapp at safety, and then also uh, JoJo McIntosh, a big hard hitting safety as well. Um, on what uh, Wisconsin is, we're going to do finish off this top ten here uh, before we sign off for the day. Um, Wisconsin, their offensive line always been a big thing. Paul Chris is a big offensive line guy, obviously. Um, with his staff, they're going to try and get uh, some big, big guys in there to replace uh, some of the voids they've had due to uh, due to drafting. Uh, looks like this year it's going to be Bo Ben Schwartzel, David Edwards, and Michael De- uh, Deiter uh, to be the big guys that are going to fill in those holes. Uh, they did, I mean, well, not fill in the holes, be the guys who were there, and they had to get some guys fill in the holes. Obviously, those guys that have said were the all Americans. I was mixing me mixing me up a little bit. Uh, but no, Wisconsin. You got to protect Alex Hornibrook. I mean, if he's going to be even serviceable next year, you got to be able to make sure he is uh, uh, safe and sound back there behind lines scrimmage. At Miami, it, um, it's probably, it's going to be that linebacker position. Obviously, they have to figure out what they're going to do with the receiver. I think is a little weak, but definitely the uh, defense, that linebacker position. When they have ath- very athletic linebackers, I mean, I mean, even you, you could probably look at the if you look at interceptions up by a position next last year. You think obviously the secondary is going to lead that a cornerback of safety, but they had a bunch of linebackers with some great hands, and uh, they were definitely wearing that turnover chain with pride last year. Uh, had a bunch of guys in that linebacker position. Shaq Quarterman um, is uh, definitely a guy to watch. Also, Michael Pickney and Zach McLeod um, are two guys to look at this season as well. Could be wearing that bling bling, that bling coming up this season on the sideline. Uh, at Michigan State, it's always been they've had always been. Um, Kind of a very even. They've always been a well known for an even team. Secondary has been a big uh, deal for them. But a bunch of guys drafted into the NFL from the secondary uh, position um, this year. It looks like it's going to be um, their big cor- uh, they have a Big Ten safe all Big Ten safety David Dowell coming back, as well as uh, Josh Josiah Scott uh, is another guy who did play all ga- all twelve games last year um, as a freshman. So he'll be coming back with a bunch of those games under his belt just as a sophomore, which is really good. You always like it when you see a freshman who's able to start all twelve games. Because that means he's just set up for more success. He's already got a bunch of experience under his belt, and he's going to come in as a sophomore, um, or already kind of a veteran there at Michigan State. Uh, at Michigan, it's the pass rush. Um, they've always been, I mean, obviously, uh, the defensive line is going to be a big deal for them. But getting those linebackers in there as well to get find, uh, getting those defensive linemen in there to find holes for those linebackers to shoot the gaps to get to the quarterback. I mean, Big Ten uh, in Michigan, obviously. The scoring is not really the biggest deal. Uh, there is there's a lot of there's believe me there's plenty of blowouts, plenty of high scoring games, but it's not not really a shootout. So you have a lot of ground and pound games. I mean, we saw even that I was talking about that Michigan Iowa game last year it was fourteen thirteen or something like that. Never always going to have a few games with some bad weather up there in the north uh, part of our country. So. Uh, definitely uh, the pass rush, being able to stop the run and get after the quarterback is going to be a huge, 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 huge deal for um, for Jim Harbaugh and his uh, team. Is they want to keep they want to keep Shea Patterson on the field as much as possible, get him back out there, keep the defense off the field as well. So that will wrap it up for today's show. As we have gone over a bunch of stuff today, we did uh, some way too early week one talk. Uh, for the first segments, looking at some matchups for uh, the game, big big matchups coming up. Obviously, we have LSU and Miami. We have Alabama, Louisville, with uh, Washington and Auburn 
coming up uh, this, and then also Michigan and Notre Dame uh, coming up week one of this season as we are now 100 days away. We also talked about some stuff to look forward to uh, over the off season as we just think about some stuff to watch. I mean, maybe make a list. I know I kind of made a little list there and went through it as things I wanted to key on coming into this season because there's some question marks out there. There's going to be some surprises. There's going to be some things that are going to go exactly as we expected, as always. Um, but we're uh, definitely a lot of things that we're um, going to be waiting on and um, hopefully impressed by, especially up there in Michigan. I'm really excited to see how Jim Harbaugh does with uh, uh, actual passing, qu- a guy who could actually play back there. Nothing against Wilton Spate. But uh, I think Shea Patterson is going to be a better option there for uh, Jim Harbaugh to kind of groom and and uh, turn into a highly touted first pick, first round pick. And then in that last time we did go over um, some of the strengths of these top t- of those top ten teams might go come back to that um, eventually. Did do 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 some we did look at some for all twenty five teams as well. So I'm going to sign off. See you guys on Friday. Everybody enjoy your week. Go watch some football. Go listen to the foot culture, uh, the fantasy football show. If you want to talk about NFL stuff, I did had a good show yesterday. Uh, went over, did a little um, draft simulator, as well as talking about some of the overall top, uh, the overall rankings on fantasy pros. Uh, did position by position last week. So go look at the fantasy football show as well if you want to do NFL. All right, we'll see you on Friday, everybody. Bye. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program